Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on your time zone. My name is Miriam Kaloon and I'm an associate in Gibson Dunn's international arbitration team in New York. I'm very pleased to welcome you all today to the second session of our ongoing series on reconceptualizing international law in partnership with IILA and the UCLA TWAIL seminar, as well as with co-sponsorship from NUS and Singapore. Today's panel follows a very enlightened first discussion that we had in December with Special Rapporteur Achiyume, where we discussed the case for reconceptualizing international law. If you weren't able to join us for this session, I would recommend watching um, the recording. It's available on IILA's website for viewing. In our discussion today, our esteemed panel will now be tackling the important question of the hurdles and obstacles that exist preventing the equal participation and equal impact of all persons in the formation of international law. As a legal system, international law is unique in the sense that lawmaking occurs both in formal settings, such as treaty conferences, and also informally through day-to-day -day decisions which can affect the development of customary international law and general principles of international law. We're very fortunate to have a panel today that is well-versed across many of the fora where such lawmaking takes place. And while each has incredible and lengthy biographies, for the sake of maximizing discussion time, I'm going to offer a brief introduction of each of our speakers. We're very pleased to be welcoming the Honorable Ambassador, Dr. Michael Kanu today. He is currently the Ambassador and Deputy Permanent Representative to the Mission for Sierra Leone to the UN. In this role, he is involved with coordinating the African Group's efforts in the Sixth Committee of the General Assembly. We're also joined by the Honourable Ambassador Marie Jacobson. She is currently the Principal Legal Advisor on International Law for the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Amongst other appointments, she is a member of the Permanent Court of International Arbitration and a designated arbitrator under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. She has extensive experience in high level multilateral and bilateral negotiations. She's also joined by Professor Deer Tladi. He is currently Professor of International Law at the University of Pretoria and a member of the International Law Commission. He has previously served as the Principal State Law Advisor for International Law for the South African Department of International Relations and Cooperation and as Legal Advisor to the South African Mission to the United Nations. We're finally also joined by Professor Diane Desierto. She is currently Associate Professor of Human Rights Law and Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame and serves as legal expert for bodies including the UN Open-Ended Working Group of States on the Right to Development. She's also active as counsel in human rights and public interest related economic disputes in the Philippines and Southeast Asia, including in matters successfully litigated before the UN Human Rights Committee, the International Criminal Court, the Philippine Supreme Court, the Philippine Commission on Human Rights, and the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Our panel today will be moderated by founder and executive director of IILA, Daniel Stewart. Daniel has worked at the Special Court for Sierra Leone and the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, the European Courts of Human Rights, the Constitutional Court of South Africa, and the Supreme Court of Israel, as well as the International Court of Justice. I'll hand it over to Daniel now to take it away. Thank you, Mariam. <clears throat> uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. I'm sure you're all bored of that hilarious remote video messaging introduction, but uh, such is the life. Uh, happy New Year, I suppose that's, that's new. And welcome, as, as Mariam said, to, to session two of our Reconceptualizing International Law series. Uh, uh, transformation is hot right now, uh, and, but we'd like to think we're on or head of said curve. Well, you know, we've been doing it for decades, so perhaps I couldn't quite say that. But today we're going back to the future, so to speak. Uh, and as, as Mariam said, what a what a panel uh, in terms of your experience, thinking, working, writing, uh, in, in all aspects of the, of the making of international law. Um, one thing I suppose Mariam didn't say is also in my sort of uh, many years at the, at the United Nations, was also very much heavily involved in a lot of these bodies and it sort of was through these experiences and perhaps some of these frustrations at seeing some of the challenges and obstacles to the full participation of uh, different groups, different peoples, uh, all genders and races perhaps that actually inspired in, in some part uh, my founding of ILA. Uh, 
I won't uh, hold us back. Um, the format sort of uh, for today is I'm going to turn to each of the four speakers to sort of get their take based on those experiences. As Maren said, it, it couldn't be more deep, uh, rich, um, and varied across expert bodies, governments, uh, like I said, uh, both uh, formal and informal, to sort of get their, their take, their 50,000 feet take, uh, perhaps from different perspectives, on that state of the making of international law and perhaps setting out in different ways some of the concrete hurdles that they see, uh, uh, the, the challenges to the, the best, I wouldn't say utopian, um, I'm told not to use that word, um, it's like we're trying to realistic utopia in, in making uh, international law. Uh, after we've heard from each of our, of our four speakers, we'll go to a sort of more of a round table format um, I will throw uh, questions at them, uh, probe based on what they've said, and uh, also some of these challenges in terms of, again, in line with the point of this series to see, can we think of some concrete and tangible ways? Uh, and maybe not, is this really the problem that, that we're posing and uh, how to move forward uh, and upwards um, into what can only be a better year than, than last year, he says with perhaps optimism. Um, uh, we will start, and I will hand over first to Professor uh, Tladi to get his views and perspectives on this. First, Tladi. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, um, and thank you, Mariam, for for inviting me. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and also thank you to all of you for joining us. I'm I'm, I'm very happy to be sharing um, my thoughts. Um, on on these questions, uh, I guess the the overarching question that we are asked to look at is whether or not um, international law making uh, reflects some sort of equal participation, um, whether all voices are heard um, in the making of international law. Um, there are different facets to this question. Uh, you could look at this question from a gender perspective. You could look at it from a, uh, states versus non-state actor perspective. You can look at it from culture. You can look at it from develop, developing country perspective, which is the most dominant theme, I guess, sort of um, when this question is posed. You can look at it from religion. You can look at it from a number of facets. Um, I think the answer to the question, regardless of the facet that you're looking at, and it's clear also from Daniel's introduction, is an emphatic no. I think we all know that. I don't think that there's a real debate about that. Um, it's one of those questions that isn't discussed precisely because the answer is so obvious. Um, uh, so, so as I say, um, my, my take, my, um, because it's such a big question and there's so many different, <clears throat> and there's so many different perspectives from which you can look at it. Um, I thought I would look at it from the perspective of sort of the main organs of uh, the United Nations. And I'll just time myself. I'll, I'll just sort of speak. And <clears throat> I mean, at some point, I'll just stop. In the, <clears throat> I'm in the middle. Um, I'll start with the International Law Commission, which is uh, a subsidiary organ of which I'm a member. And I'll just share with you sort of a couple of things um, that, that signify the extent to which there isn't equal participation and not all voices are heard in, um, the lawmaking. Um, I will focus on, on one aspect. So I won't talk about the gender aspect, which is, I think the, um, uh, the, the aspect that, that has been in the spotlight, at least in the last couple of years, I won't talk about that. I'm sure we'll talk about that later or somebody else will raise it, um, in the course of the discussion. Um, I will, though, um, speak about uh, the participation of states. I think that's the, 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 the first entry point is to what extent um, are all states' voices reflected in the work of the commission? Uh, 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 so with all of these organs, I'll be very superficial because I only have eight minutes or so. And again, I'm sure we'll come back to these. But um, we all know that when it comes to the written observation that are received by states, predominantly, these come from developed states. Uh, in fact, I'll give you a typical example. I mean, if you think about um, migration, migration is an issue that affects developing states a lot. We had a, um, the opportunity to finalize um, a migration related topic, which is expulsion of aliens. I don't like that name, but in any event, expulsion of aliens. Um, and you will be shocked to hear that only one African state 
actually made written observations. Um, and it's not, that's not unusual, right? Um, and so obviously that means that, that, that um, um, the views of African states and the views of other states um, from the developing world are large, uh, rarely ever heard, at least from the perspective of um, written observations. I will say this, that over the last couple of years, the commission in finalizing its work has begun also to rely on oral statements, which sort of um, reduces the problem a little bit because um, all states speak, right? So if you go into the sixth committee and you listen to what states have to say about the work of the, uh, of the ILC, you will find that there's um, um, an inequality there. But even there, if you sort of peel the layers, you find that there is a difference, at least in terms of quality. Um, uh, most African states, Michael will tell you, um, most African states that participate write their statement in the week of the sixth committee when the report is being heard. Uh, if you ask Marie Jakobsen, she will tell you that their statements go through a rigorous process in capital. There's a lot of deliberation. So there's a lot of thought that goes into it. I'll share with you an anecdote. Um, I was in the sixth committee and one delegate, I will not mention which delegate, but it was a delegate from a developing country, said to me, can you please share with me your statement? I'd want to make a statement tomorrow. I mean, that's 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 pretty much. So, so even with oral statements, even though you find a lot of, uh, up comments from all states, including developing states, uh, very often the comments from developing states aren't the considered views of the state. They are the views made in New York by the legal advisor who's talking to his friends. And so again, uh, the views of the state are very often um, not reflected. Um, one of the main elements in sort of driving the work of the commission is the special rapporteur. Um, so it's very interesting also to look at the participation. So in this context, I'm talking now about the participation of the members of the commission themselves. And it's very interesting to look at sort of the, the profile of um, 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 the profile of special rapporteurs. And I've made a few notes here. So um, since 1946 up until today, we've had, I think, around 63, 64 um, special rapporteurs. Um, seven of them have come from the African country. So out of 60, whatever, 63, 64, only seven have come from a continent with 54 states. Uh, nine of them have come from Latin America. Uh, five have come from Asia. Uh, I mean, Latin America has got 33 states. So it's Latin America and uh, the Caribbean. Uh, I mean, the Asia group with its 53 states have only had five. We are, let's, so Western Europe and others group with its 29 states has had more than half. So more than half, so more than 31, more than 32 uh, special rapporteurs have come from We York. Uh, nine um, um, special rapporteurs have, have come from the Eastern European group, also with around 28, 27 states, right? So again, this shows you the disproportion in terms of special rapporteurships um, from the developing world um, versus um, 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 developed world. Let me be clear at least as far as this second element is concerned, the participation from um, the African members, uh, these are, these, these are self-inflicted wounds, right? Um, the, the reality is that if, uh, and again, this is something that's known by most people that participate in, in these things. Uh, so the reality is that um, members from developing countries are generally not very active. So there's always a very small group of developing uh, states members that participate actively in the work of the Law Commission, um, and the others just simply don't participate. Um, so again, that, that shows through nobody else's fault except our own, I guess, um, the, the fact that the voice of the developing world um, um, is not heard. Um, so I could say a lot more, but I'll stop there because um, I... Um, in fact, I think I've run out of time. I, uh, I'll just mention the UN Security Council if you don't mind. Uh, the UN Security Council makes law. Um, uh, in the past, the UN Security Council, with its immense power, had two main constraints. So the one constraint was that it have, had a very narrow subject area of jurisdiction, if you like, right? So peace and security. Um, the other constraint was that um, its function was to address very specific situation for an imme immediate response. All of those, so, so both of those, these constraints are now gone. Um, so here you have this immense body uh, with immense power, which literally has no constraint. It can deal with anything, be it peace and security, uh, sexual violence, uh, 
um, whatever you could potentially be discussed, um, the only constraint essentially is dynamics. Um, and here you have a body that absolutely makes law um, and it has very little constraint. And again, if you look at the composition of the UN Security Council, um, um, it's clearly um, inclined towards the developed world and not the developing country. So again, this in these bodies, in all of them, I was going to go through all of them. I was going to go through the ILC, uh, the UN Security Council, the General Assembly, and show how even that body is inclined towards the developed uh, um, world. Uh, I mean, of course, the International Court of Justice, but I'm sure we can come back to these when we do um, um, the roundtable discussion. Um, thank you. Thank you, Deary. Yes, I know I've, I've tasked you all with answering the most obvious but macro questions. Um, so thank you for keeping. We will get back to many of those uh, uh, points. Uh, I'll now hand over to uh, Ambassador Jacobson uh, next in our role. Ambassador Jacobson. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me now? You can hear me. Yeah, yes. very good. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, and, and uh, all the organizers to this very interesting uh, session and seminar. Uh, with, um, and like um, my former colleague from the ILC, Dira, I, um, I, I, I also had certain difficulties to understand whether I understood <laughs> all the uh, questions that you posed to us. Um, I, I, I would, of course, have a lot of uh, comments and reflections on what, what Dira just said, not least with regarding, regarding the, the ILC, uh, since I was also a member of the Commission for, for 10 years and a special rapporteur uh, for a topic. Uh, I recognize what he said to some extent. Uh, I am glad that he said that, that uh, the ILC is taking into account also what is said in the sixth committee. I had a feeling we did that already when I started in 2007 and onwards, but we could come back to that uh, later. Now, my starting point is really, uh, the, the, if we, if we, my starting point is really the classical traditional view on lawmaking, namely that states create law. Uh, either through uh, international uh, agreements or bilateral agreements or, when, or even at the regional level, of course, not binding for third parties. But anyway, that's the sort of traditional step. When then we could just lean back and say, well, then it's fine. But it is not fine because in order for all voices to be heard, those who represent the states must be representative of those who live in the states and of the international community. And this is where my uh, gender perspective comes in, because it's not sufficient that you have one woman who is the head of uh, delegation who negotiate. It is what penetrates to the position that the state is taken and pronounces when the state is negotiating or participating in formulating customary law, or even in the, what is today called informal lawmaking, or even in soft law, different, uh, soft law processes. So if the women's voices are not incorporated and heard from the grassroots level up to the position where they are able to participate and take decision, their voices will not be heard in the formal lawmaking process. And there are so many, you would think this is, I mean, this is not a problem any longer. We have, we have a gender perspective now on the ILC. Well, Dira is right, there's been a gender discussion on the ILC, but it's still the states that nominates those who are sitting in the ILC. It is still states that nominate who will be court members of the courts, who will be members of UN special bodies. So if, if, you do, if states do not, if there is no pressure in the state, or if the women are not formulating this and they participate from a grassroots level, the, 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 we will never have a proper gender reflection. Still, women consist of 50% or even more uh, of most states' uh, communities. So I see that as a very, 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 very crucial thing. And this is particularly true when it comes to important issues, such as the formation of international peace and security, 
such as formation and participation in peace building and peace processes, where we see how very, very few women are actually forming, form, uh, formulating that what later will become a formal peace treaty. Because we all know, for example, when you negotiate in a, a ceasefire or so on, you, you normally start with, with those who have been active in the war, and they're normally men. This is just one example. I can give you several examples. But my point is that there is an obligation for states to ensure under international law that women are part of this formation, the formative process. You just have to read this uh, CEDO, the uh, this Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, because it clearly says that states parties shall ensure women on equal terms with men, the right to participate in the formulation of government policy and implementation thereof. And a position in international law, on international law, is clearly a formation of a government policy. Now, so not only do the women have a right to formulate government policy, states have, a, have an obligation to ensure that women, and I quote, on equal terms with men, and without any discrimination, have the opportunity to represent the governments at the international level and to participate in the work of international organizations. Now, uh, I, I think that this is something that we very often forget. We can refer to CEDO or to Resolution 1325 and all the subsequent resolution is, is this was not enough, but it is not enough. It is not enough to argue that even if all the states in the world participate in the process, it will not reflect a proper, all-inclusive participation in the formation of the law, unless women are ensured equal participation from start to the end. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Jacobson. We're getting the... the entire spectrum as a starting point. So just uh, heating up for the round table. Um, so I have more questions and thoughts already, which is good, good. Um, next, I'm gonna hand over Professor Desierto um, uh, from what looks like paradise in the background, but to give her perspectives from a variety of perspectives. Professor Desierto, Desierto excuse me, over to you. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you to the ILA for the invitation um, and a good day to everybody throughout the world who is spending time listening on uh, to this discussion. In my eight to 10 minutes, I'm going to speak about the common lingering problem about the democratization of sources of state practice and customary law, and also the continuing parallel problem of how we make assessments and whether they're sufficiently global of treaty practices when they are cited for purposes of some of the sources of international law. The inspiration from this is from former President Higgins, Rosalind Higgins 1991 Hague Academy lectures, which was also echoed in subsequent lectures by Professor Michael Riesman. And the question was simply this, how do we visualize the international system? And asking that question presupposes that in the constructs of international law, whether they be in the process of lawmaking through judicial decision-making, through arbitral decision-making, or in the process of treaty-making, when we capture or visualize the international system, is it in Michael Riesman's terms, an archipelago of certain islands having more dominance than the other, of certain territories having more of a voice than the other? And in consensus with everybody else in this group, the short answer is yes, um, international law was born in a situation of asymmetry with an aspiration to equality under the Charter of the United Nations. But make no mistake, the inequalities that we see are inherent in the system. And I would hazard there are three main obstacles to the democratization of how we understand sources of state practice and how we globally assess treaty practices. And the obstacles are threefold. The first is conceptual. There are differing theories on the selection of formal and material sources, and they are accordingly reflected either in juristic reasoning or even in treaty-making practices and indices of treaty practices. 
Second is structural. When we look at institutional mechanisms and how institutions such as the United Nations and other international organizations, particularly in the areas of trade, finance, or investment, there are specialist, specialist designs in these institutions and resources that are specifically allocated and privilege certain voices above that of others. This is not an Aristotelian conception of democracy where everybody has a voice, say somewhat like social media, but by virtue of expertise and by virtue of certain deliberate functional choices in these fields of international law, there are specific gatekeepers with respect to who gets to participate and who is heard and who is not. The third obstacle in my view is ideological because there are inherently in the international system authoritative decision makers, or as I said, gatekeepers who determine which sources are relevant, which practices are relevant, and what is supposed to be representative of the international system. We take it for granted as part of the canon of being international lawyers that we can visualize what the international community is. But do we ever stop at any point in time in our constructions to truly understand what that international community is? When we say developing country versus developed country, is that such an easy dichotomy to make? When the global south versus the global north, the rather archaic characterization of global south versus global north, fails to make the appropriate distinctions for the individual diversities of members of the global south, of members of the global north. We've fallen into convenient categories and fictions of core versus periphery, but in one way that also occludes diversity. And we see that particularly in my own case, working at the UN Working Group on the Right to Development, where ironically it is the G77, uh, the non-aligned movement that is active in driving the treaty making process. And those of us in the experts group are tasked to, uh, to assist. We find that some voices are more uh, resonant than others. We find that in one of the, partic one of the particular sessions, the international, uh, the global North states, chose not to participate, chose not to be part of the process, disagreed with the creation of a legally binding instrument. And to what extent, therefore, when and the one particularly powerful session we had during our consultation process, when the representative of indigenous people said, we do not represent a state, and yet the decisions that are being taken here on our behalf are being taken by others who have chosen not to recognize our legitimacy as a people, our fundamental human rights. So without being able to square that circle, how then do we take a look at cases that are resolved by the International Court of Justice, which has never, at least in the, in the apt scholarship of other scholars who have pointed out, never had an explicitly articulated theory or method for the kind of taxonomy of sources that it refers to. Um, it was not until the last 10 years that the court started referring beyond itself, but also started referring to practices of other international tribunals, to treaties in certain parts of the world, certainly not that of others. To a certain extent, this made me think, um, having formerly clerked at the court, that I used to wonder, why is there an anglophone and francophone dominance when it comes to research? Um, why do we rely so much on international councils and state agents to bring forth the indices of state practice and what they deem to be relevant treaty practices? And yet this is a self-perpetuating loop because the same international councils and the same state agents have primarily been schooled in Francophone or Anglophone schools of thought in international law. The tendency is to zero in on practices and by and indices and country, um, country practices that are readily identifiable. You will almost never find examples drawn say from Oceania and yet they are just, the member states of Oceania are equal sovereign states and there's hardly any reference, especially even on questions involving climate change where they are most affected. It's worse when it comes to arbitral awards because where at least the International Court of Justice has some 
structural geographic representation. Or there is no geographic representation in arbitral tribunals, let alone true diversity, gender, race, or otherwise. The sources that are predominantly referred to are North American, European, G20 nation practices, especially in the case of investment arbitration. And again, that's a self-perpetuating loop, depending on who are the councils, who are those who are assisting the arbitrators, who are the arbitrators themselves, and why is international law still conditioned on the lens of an international system that is a partial picture and not a truly global picture. So in conclusion, let me offer three tentative views as to why I think this is an ongoing problem. One is we have never as an international system writ large seriously addressed the problem of access by non-state actors. We've tried to formalize some opportunities, for example, in investment or in trade for non-disputing parties to present their views, but this has never truly been participatory and there has not been a concerted effort to allow non-state actors more say or voice in the process. Even smaller states, as I said, Oceania, almost never have a say um, when it comes to the, the verification of what their practices are and what their beliefs might be as to the formulation of custom. There's hardly any reference to smaller states. Representation, my second point is representation when we think about it and we talk about it, it should also be equitably visualized. And by this, I mean, we have to take into account the historical asymmetries of achieving voice and meaning, meaningful opportunities for action in the international system. And I'm not just talking about the continuing legacies of decolonization. I'm talking about the continuing asymmetries of those who have been perennially excluded from the process outside of a state framework and which has never been seriously addressed in any of the international institutions. And finally, one thing that, that's something that I think is still a deficit, whether in specialized areas or in more general international law, is the existence of a truly deliberative mechanism that enables participation when there is a dysfunction or a breakdown in political representation, much as what Ambassador Jacobson was referring to. And I asked this, what channels exist for those who are directly affected by trade rules? Why is it that corporations have a higher voice when it comes to lobbying rules, as opposed to communities that are directly affected by trade losses, by job losses from trade, the destruction of, um, the destruction of jobs uh, as resulting from trade creation? There is also no channels when it comes to development decision-making. All of this is done at the top when it comes to governments, when it comes to states, when it comes to influential actors and not at the level of communities. So let me stop there and say that insofar as the, the, the problem of the democratization of sources of state practice and, and the global assessment of treaty practices are concerned, until we address conceptual, structural, and ideological problems in a more intentional manner, reconceptualizing international law will very much remain a mythic exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dusieto. Don't worry, we have at least an hour to solve all of those problems. So uh, if you're on the line and worried, don't be. Um, we're gonna dive down into concrete and tangible as much as we can, but uh, certainly this is really grappling with the scope of the of the issues, but throwing up even more ideas. Uh, finally, for our starting off section, I hand over uh, to Ambassador uh, Kanu, uh, currently in Freetown. Uh, Michael, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um, Allow me to start by firstly um, acknowledging the um, members of the panel and uh, their guests. Happy New Year to you all. Um, thank you, Mariam, for the kind introduction. I was going to skip that, but I just wanted to point out that I coordinate the African group on BBNJ and a few other issues. And my kind friend and brother, Tabo Mulefe of South Africa, coordinates the African group itself in the Sixth Committee. So I just wanted to, to point that out and let it don't be a coup d'etat as early as 2021 in January. It, it, it gives me great pleasure, and I'm very delighted to join this distinguished panel to share a few thoughts on this important issue of reconceptualizing international law. Of course, with a focus on making international law in the second panel uh, of the discussion series. 
Indeed, um, as with the other panelists, I'm grateful to the organizers, um, IILA, UCLA, and Gibson Dunn for the kind invitation. In examining the current state of um, international lawmaking, I will endeavor to limit this intervention to uh, at least processes at the United Nations, uh, being a state party representative in the Sixth Committee, and also that will allow me to focus on a sort of a moment in time issue, which is um, the ongoing BBNJ negotiation. I, I will come to explaining the acronym later. And also it, it affords me the opportunity to reinforce a view that um, the United Nations is still increasingly seen as a, a legitimate institution for creating a global legal order for future international cooperation. So intergovernmental conferences convened under the auspices of um, the United Nations remain to be a primary modality for international lawmaking for those subjects which must be treated with a global perspective. And that, in, that includes human rights, disarmament, international crime, migration, the use of force, the conduct of war, but also to regulating the, the global common, so the environment, sustainable development, international waters, outer space, global communication and world trade. Um, people associated with the process will know that um, the UN enjoys a sort of a legitimacy cloak in international lawmaking. And, and I argue that this legitimacy claim is fraught with latent historical, organizational, practical challenges, which, um, uh, which inadvertently fosters a pursuit of a limiting doctrinal vision and equally limited reference to the evolutionary and pluralistic nature of international community. Uh, you may want to note that this claim has been developed in the context of um, international laws complicity in the colonization project on the one hand, and also the full knowledge that developing states initially left out of the lawmaking process until recently have ensured the establishment of the principle of effective participation in international lawmaking in order to uh, make uh, the lawmaking process or forum representative of the international community, both um, qualitatively and quantitatively. And of course, the reason why the UN is looked at as a legitimate forum for international lawmaking is its political and universal nature in which um, state holds only one and uh, uh, formally equal vote. Every state can participate with equal footing in an international lawmaking process carried out under the authority of the UN. Accordingly, develop, developing states, particularly small and developing states with no global, political, economic or military bargaining power to influence the practice of state would prefer to rely on treaties as a formal source of international law. In negotiating this written specific and obligatory instrument of international law, the preference for UN legitimacy is rooted in its chartered principle that engenders full and effective participation in the international lawmaking process. So what does equal opportunity really mean in the current um, practical context? Answering this question requires us attaining the concrete hurdles or obstacles in between equal participation and impact. It also assists in revealing who gets to shape international law more easily at the UN and what we need and can change. In answering this question, I will approach this from, as I say, the, um, the ongoing BBNG negotiations as the international legal binding instrument under the, the UN Convention on Law of the Sea on the, conversation, on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. And if time permits, I will have a quick look at the um, engagement with respect to um, the International Law Commission and um, from a small developing state nexus perspective, based on a paper that I, I recently um, written on that, on that issue. And I hope in the question and answer session, Daniel, I'll come to the recent negotiation at the um, International Criminal Court Assembly of State Parties on the, um, in the, in the independent review process and the mechanism that was established and how the legit legitimacy argument was raised by the African state parties. On the UN conferences, I, I further argue that um, it's really a test of um, the resolve, resilience, and the resources of state parties. Um, in its resolution 72249 of 24 December 2017, the General Assembly decided to convene an intergovernmental conference under the auspices of the UN to consider the recommendation of the Preparatory Committee established by another resolution 62292 of um, 19 June 2015 on the elements to elaborate the, the text, the BBNG text. Now, of course, the conference had a three-day organizational meeting in New York in uh, 2018, and so far we've had about three of the four assigned uh, um, um, conferences sessions, and um, save for COVID-19, would have had the um, fourth session um, um, in the past year. Now, in the process so far, 
Um, there hasn't been any suggestion of the absence of legitimacy or possible non-acceptance of the outcome of um, the negotiation, notwithstanding the um, diametrically opposed and contending issues and principles being negotiated. However, owing to the recommendations of the Preparity Committee, some legal commentators suggest the notion of fit accomplished for some of the most contending issues, in particular, the governing legal, the governing legal regime. Now, you may want to ask, why is this the case for a UN convened process? The answer may lie in the working methods, decision on organizational and, and procedural matters, which if not followed consistently, often determine the trends of negotiation and the state with some latent advantages. Uh, this is why you know, negotiators devote a great deal of time and effort to ensuring that um, they have their preferred organizational and procedural rules over others. So uh, as I argue, it's surely a test of the resolve of states the resilience of their political system and interest, and also the issue of um, resources to follow through on these um, UN processes from the introduction of the item by a group of states or interested group to negotiating um, the organization and procedural matters, but also dealing with the substantive negotiation and post adoption in terms of the follow through and the day to day decision making for implementation and application. For sm most small and developing states, the, the pool of expertise is really limited, and not just limited, but also overburdened. Um, I, I'll give an example, whilst we are also dealing with the ICC and the ASP and in negotiation, we are also doing some online intersessional inter work with the BBNJ. And so you find out that it's the same representative from small and, and developing states that would deal with um, ICC issue, international criminal law and justice, but also um, um, the issue of um, biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. So really when we talk about this equal opportunity, what we should be talking about is equity. Uh, we can certainly talk about um, the approaches being used to deal with this equity issue and the imbalances that exist. Uh, that is um, the institution of trust funds, bilateral support and the like. Um, all to ensure that we engender full and effective participation by um, member states. Now, in my experience, what has proven to be effective thus far is the pooling of resources to regional and interest group and the greater role of non-state actors or observers and other stakeholders in the international lawmaking process. So the pooling of resources to the regional and interest groups allow for economies of scale, it also allows for a level of devotion that um, not just consistency and resilience. Um, there's a greater role for non-state um, observers that will support transparency, facilitation of water and engagement, especially in intersectional work and discussion, all very useful tools to test ideas, position, preferences, particularly when it comes to issues about regulating the global commons. And indeed, I'm happy to explore uh, this area further in the question and answer session. Now, I'll just briefly move on to um, the ILC because of its relations with the Sixth Committee and how um, small developing states interact with the work of um, um, the Commission. And um, I, I tried my hardest not to get into this because I know we have a former member of the Commission, but also a president member in the Commission. And I, I'm glad that uh, uh, my submission would sort of complement what has been said already from both the um, um, gender perspective, but also the issues which um, uh, MDA has uh, basically pointed towards my direction in terms of participation of African state parties. Now, in a contribution to commemorate the 70th anniversary of um, the ILC, I examine in the light of the consensus principle that underpins the progressive development of international law and its codification on how much of um, this process has involved and incorporated the perspectives and needs of small and developing states. I measure the level of participation by small and developing states and examine the future role of the ILC through the lens of its relationship with the Sixth Committee. On the basis of um, the sovereign equality principle and expectation of equal opportunity, I was able to show that um, the envisioned symbiosis and optimal actualization of the extensive engagement principle um, is being inhibited by the current working relationship between the ILC and the Sixth Committee, but also coupled with um, the lack of resources and capacity on the part of small and developing states to effectively participate in the work of the Commission and of course, to follow through on his uh, recommendation. Now, I'll just uh, skip down what I have noted down for um, discussion and just refer to a particular quotation from a delegation on um, the when the um, Sixth Committee debated, debated the report of the ILC 
in 2018 and uh, really discussing the challenges faced by state parties, including small um, um, developing states. Um, and, and I quote, the IOC relies on the feedback of member states to progress its work. It is indeed obliged to do so by virtue of provisions within its statute. This requires the ILC to circulate questionnaires to government, request from the latter texts of laws, decrees, judicial decision, and other documents relevant to the topics being discussed, as well as to invite comments on the drafts of its work. For the ILC, receiving comments and information from member states is fundamental to its work. However, it is important to take into consideration issues of capacity, whereby some member states, including the African states and small island developing states, can be at a disadvantage when it comes to timely compilation of documents and adequate follow-up on ILC requests. In, in, in the paper, I was able to argue that ensure that um, the substantive work of the commission is really influenced by the numbers. So for example, we, with respect to the addition of um, the topic sea level rise in relation to international law, the syllabus made it very clear that the number of countries which call for the inclusion of the topic in the commission's long-term program of work and the number of other state parties, state member states that expressed the importance of the topic impacted on its consideration. In some sense, what um, uh, this is saying is that um, the, the substance is really linked to uh, the numbers and, 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 and so the relevance of participation in, in the debates and the work of the commission um, will tell you the impact of its work and, and, and how the, the substantive recommendations will, will come out. Now, in the consideration of um, the reports of the ILC since 2012, there seemed to be a constant quantum of member states participating in the debate, with, of course, majority being developed countries from particularly one geographical group. There is serious deficiency in the level of engagement by small and developing countries in the submission of written comments and observations as well. The pattern in the past decade also suggests that member states become engaged when a topic is of particular interest, for example, sea level rise. Significantly, it must be underscored that practice of um, group statements seem to be the route to reflect a broader range of views on the work of the ILC during the six committee debate. This practice may provide the needed respite and pathway to increase the level of engagement, particularly by a small developing state. Uh, I'll conclude briefly by just circling to the legitimacy issue and also cite um, uh, Judge Yusuf, uh, President of the International Court of Justice, in his keynote address at the Geneva commemoration of um, the 70th um, anniversary of the ILC, where he reminded that indeed delegates of um, newly independent states in the Sixth Committee influenced, for example, the provision of invalidity of a treaty procured by threat or the use of force in the law of treaties, and also ignited interest in the consideration of um, the provisional application of treaties. This really goes to show that um, when states are in a position to engage in international lawmaking under the auspices of the UN, including the work of the ISC, ILC, the program and method of work may provide the path to do so, following the establishment and acceptance of the principle of um, effective participation, a sort of um, democratization of the international lawmaking process. This does not, however, disclose the latent challenges, that's the practical and day-to-day -day logistical challenges that threatens um, this legitimacy in the context of um, informed consent and also eventual acceptance of um, the instruments which uh, we negotiate. So when we're thinking of transforming the future of um, lawmaking process, uh, we must therefore take um, note of this legitimacy concern. And as I noted, the third scenario, which was um, the um, International Criminal Court Assembly of State Parties negotiation, on the independent um, 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 review mechanism. One of the big um, concerns raised by the African State Party was to ensure that the mechanism is fully representative to take care of this legitimacy concern. And I'm, I will be happy to talk about that in the question and answer session. And I thank you for uh, the bit of um, time in all this, um, 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 Daniel, and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Kanu. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's the same person, sorry for using the two names. Um, well, uh, that's all the problems, we'll leave it there. No, um, as they say, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, but we've, we've laid out a lot of the issues. And as, uh, as Professor Pilate said at the beginning, to kick off often so obvious, so many of you, you know, we could spend a lifetime, many people do, reading, writing, thinking about these problems, they're not new, though they are evolving. Um, but now as we turn to the round table, I'm gonna to try to drive down 
and how to look for some solutions, not to solve the three uh, major obstacles in, in completion, as Professor De Sieto suggested, um, but to probe concrete, tangible ways. And each of these in areas raised from all of the speakers have been discussed, little things that have been tinkered, perhaps larger, and we maybe explore why they have not been successful, some other imaginary sort of thinking. Um, the Q&A function is up and running, and uh, we'll certainly get, and I will start uh, weaving those questions in. Um, but I'm going to kick off this roundtable section, uh, which are all buzzing with despondency and, and sadness, um, before getting to some deeper dive and perhaps some solutions, just to ask uh, the panel sort of a bigger, even existential question about the nature of this problem, which is, again, for those, because uh, you know, we're trying to reach to and speak to beyond the sort of epistemic uh, community of international lawyers to say, there certainly has been equally, relatively a sort of slowdown in multilateral treaty making, if, you know, formal senses, if not beyond that. And a lot of the points raised by our speakers certainly speak to that. And I suppose my question is, you know, if that's not a problem, in the sense of historically, certainly it's been a problem, each of these areas has applied to the processes of, of, of making international law, but perhaps some of these concerns, while still valid, their impact on the world and their impact for perhaps disadvantaged peoples or, or voices that have been left out isn't so bad. You often perhaps hear that, again, just not just because we have both current uh, and uh, alumni of members, I'd rather than say former members of the ILC here, that you know, all the heavy lifting of international lawmaking was already being done, you know, the decades in the 50s, 60s, and, and 70s. And again, is this a concern, therefore, about all what we're talking about that is really sort of overblown? And if it's not, is the lack of those, you know, formal multilateral you know, treaty making and perhaps even, you know, other forms of making, is that harming some states more than others? Um, and I go back straight away to you, Michael, you're very much involved with some of these processes now. It, it, from your perspective, not only from, from, from Sierra Leone, but also just from you know, the BBMJ hat, but overall from the African group style perspective, is that a concern? Is there a feeling that you know, there is something problematic about that slowdown, that sort of break now. Break, B-R-A-K-E, otherwise. Anyway, microphone's view and then open to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, um, I'm Daniel. I, I think, firstly, I should say, yes, there's uh, some form of um, agreement that um, there's a slowdown to multilateralism and multilateral treaty making. Um, and this could be even from um, the UN perspective, even though I reckon that um, we have an ongoing uh, process, which is um, the negotiation on the um, conservation and sustainable use of um, marine biodiversity of areas beyond um, national jurisdiction. I also note that um, the ongoing engagement outside of six committee in the first committee on, on cyber security and, and, and other uh, processes which uh, may not have um, 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 overtaken the headlines. But of course, um, there is um, what we say, what, what we, we note in the political um, context that um, there are threats to uh, multilateralism, there are retreats to uh, uh, multilateralism in the sense of um, political direction, especially from um, developed states. Now, uh, as I indicated um, in the opening intervention, for uh, especially small developing states where uh, the resources that are required to really marshal practice in terms of development of uh, uh, customer international law uh, may be too burdensome for um, uh, small developing state parties and for a representative of a small developing state party. It's difficult to, um, as indicated by uh, Dere in his intervention, to respond to every invitation for comment to in uh, within um, the required time make, make submission on, you know, pretty substantive and robust issues out of concern to the international community community and, and, and small developing states. So the preference is for really um, um, reaching substantive rules, treaty making, and um, within the multilateral process where uh, small developing states also get to enjoy and benefit from 
um, in, um, group, whether regional or, or, or geographical or interest group dynamics in terms of uh, um, pursuing <coughs> interest. That said, I also must note that um, the slowdown may not only be political, but in, in some cases really um, um, the high sense of scrutiny has led to less enthusiasm in terms of uh, multilateral treaty uh, process making. And I refer to the sixth committee where we are now be uh, faced with a number of recommendations for um, convening of uh, a conference of um, um, plenty potential is to, to really um, consider um, work that has been done by the, the International Law Commission. I'll give example from beginning from state responsibility to now um, um, crimes against humanity prevention and punishment. Um, you would note if you follow the discussion that um, there are no fixed position in terms of um, whether it's premature to um, um, codify or um, um, whether really there's a fixed position on this is progressive development and so there's need for maturity and then we, we codify. You see states moving the goalposts based on issue. So it's really an, an interest-based concern. It's not a position of um, we want to see uh, um, you know more state practice for codification. It's rather this will not perhaps um, um, support uh, the interest of my state or my group of states um, um, and, and so um, codification may not be the, 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 the approach to be taken now. So yes, we have important issues and the greater scrutiny, both from, from the developed and developing state, has sort of led to some form of a, a stalemate and, 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 and inertia for, for a, a, a number of years now, especially for um, ILC-related work. Um, but when there is um, interest, particularly um, from state parties, um, and we hope we've seen engagement, for example, on the topic of um, um, sea level rise, there might be interest in pandemics and, and how to comprehensively deal with those issues. There, there might be this added impetus to, to deal with it and indeed um, call on um, support from um, um, independent um, specialized bodies, but also galvanization in terms of um, uh, the multilateral process for, for treaty making. Um, I know we have others, other members on the panel, so I'll leave it at that and um, may come back if um, there, is more, there are more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I mean, connected to that, and I will say the question is something that Professor DiCieto said, you, uh, you raised, um, the example, the case study, for example, of your work on the working group on, uh, on the right to development and about the non-engagement potentially with um, states from the sort of the global north. I think you can see other examples um, when potentially G77 or the small developing state led initiatives, for example, the business and human rights treaty process, or perhaps even the, the, the treaty on prohibition of nuclear weapons, you may say something similar, but in the reverse as, as, as Michael suggested you see the most uh, recent, I wouldn't say it was sort of uh, developed state led, but perhaps perceived as such, for example, the ILC's draft articles on crimes against humanity. So perhaps as as, as, as Michael suggested, Professor Dioto, that this is more of a sort of stalemate process, both sides, than perhaps just a, a rejection or, or um, uh, I mean, do you see ways around it other than perhaps getting to the very structural issues, which we will perhaps dive into practical things in a second, but is it sort of a stalemate looking across, you know, topics being assigned to uh, being perceived as being within the wheelhouse, human rights or environmental issues, uh, global north issues and development issues, uh, global south issues in a way that, you know, perhaps ultimately isn't useful to, to move forward to, you know, global solutions. Thank you for that, Daniel. I, I do subscribe with Ambassador Kanu's view in particular that there's certain issues that have risen where you find considerable uh, state action across the board throughout many countries, regardless of demography, demographics or profile. But we, the, I'm less troubled by the, by the slower pace of multilateralism, primarily because insofar as I'm concerned, international lawmaking is a tool. If states do not reach a decision as they failed, for example, in the Doha development round to address any of the human rights and environmental and labor issues that confront trade, 
it's not for nothing that the impasse has existed for the last 20 years. What we've seen as a reaction is that those who are most affected by these human rights impacts, for example, in the trade setting, is an increasing reliance on nested solutions through regional treaty making taking use of Article 24 agreements to make sure that the design of treaties or the creation of treaties that ensure or at least do more towards achieving sustainable development goals could be realized. But on the one hand, I agree, the impasse exists and there will always be issues that are of concern to particular countries as opposed to those of others. The question I posit is when we talk about representation, are we talking simply about state representation or are we talking about the communities themselves so that are supposed to be the ultimate addressees of the lawmaking process? That is what troubles me more, whether it happens at a higher level of lawmaking or at a more subsidiary level of lawmaking. In either way, I do not see considerably more voice or more participation for those who are truly excluded from the process. Thank you, Presidio. So let's assume in those answers that there is, the problem is real. Not that I obviously think that, wouldn't be here otherwise, and draw on some of the threads. So uh, when uh, Ambassador Jackson was speaking, uh, you know, what well, it came to my mind, and I think we've got some informal questions coming to my mind as well, linking that community gender in many different parts is about the representatives themselves and how representative they are of who they claim to be speaking. Now, the sort of terminology of sort of, you know, again, back again, hot right now, sort of intersectionality seems to be mine. But in a practical way, um, starting first with the those who are leading the sort of uh, negotiating, if you're in a position of, of power, at least somewhat, as you said, uh, Ambassador Jack is not saying power, but you can somewhat ensure for within your own state to say, not only in terms of the representatives will be representative, but also ensure that, you know, is there ways to almost require that? Or is it similar to, and I was making a parallel case study, not yet talking about the experts, but about the state officials themselves. We can have programs, you can have uh, sort of celebrations, let's say, at the, or is the wrong word, but trying to focus on the lack of representation on bodies like the ILC. But when it comes to state representatives themselves, and, uh, you know, not only Michael and Deary, you know, all being played a role in that, is it just, trying to push states themselves or is there a way to sort of almost link a requirement to say not only the individuals who are representing but the voices of who they are speaking for whether that means bringing in those voices directly as i think perhaps persistio was suggesting but how do we ensure that when laws are being made even from the government official role that they are speaking for who they claim and are at least international law is assigning them to be speaking for. Again, I promise to be more precise on the questions that probably failed, but Professor Jacobson, you know, Ambassador Jacobson, excuse me, I'm uh, intersectionality in that, is there a way to, you know, require the, a solution to the problem that you, that you set out? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. I'd like to comment on a few other things first. Uh, I, I like to, um, I see if I can have, if I will have the time to go through all the comments that I would like to make. I just want to say first on, the, on the, something that Professor K uh, Ambassador Kano said. You, you said it's about equity, not about equal opportunity. And I think you have a very, you have a very good point there. Perhaps we can get back to that later and, and I pick up on, on the question of multilateralism and your uh, question, Daniel. Um, I agree with uh, Professor Desieto that I am less concerned with the slowdown on the treaty making, the multilateral treaty making. I am so much more concerned of the withdrawal from multilateral treaties that are taking place because that sets a bad example. If, uh, if major states, important states, decides to withdraw from important multilateral disarmament treaties, the ICC, uh, whatever, there are so many uh, treaties 
that we can give example for and you all, you, I don't even have to mention it. But that sets an example signaling to all those who struggle perhaps to become parties to those treaties or to support the idea in these treaties not to do so. And against that background, it's going to be even more difficult to have an, uh, a multilateral treaty um, mechanism or a multilateral treaty process that embarks on new topics because you do not have the incentives to do so. If, if you withdraw from commitments that you have taken upon you as a state for reason that it's all of a sudden it's politically not good, it's not fit, then it is a, it's really a flash in the face to, uh, to, uh, to the rule of law and the concept of the rule of law itself. Because the rule of law at an international level as well as in, on a domestic level rests on the fact that it's not only something for you to leave when it no longer suits you. It's something that you stick to because on the whole, you as a state believe this is good for the international community and has also for me. So I'm much more concerned about that than, uh, than the slowdown in multilateral treaty mechanism, um, uh, processes. I think that uh, I, I am concerned about that as, as well, but if I have to pick between the two, I rather be we, more concerned with the withdrawal from, from multilateral treaty uh, treaties or even at the regional, uh, on the regional scene when, when we see, for example, certain EU member states that are no longer really supportive of all the regulations of the EU, what the EU has done. Now, that uh, I think is a, is a, is a major problem uh, in, 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 in the law um, forming processes of the world today. I, I do have a question I, I find that is really related to, uh, to Professor Desieto when we talked about um, uh, standing before courts. So I, I, I have a feeling and I, that the, there, is, there may be a new development on this and that relates to environmental protection where more and more courts have recognized that uh, communities and, and even and, and, and those who are most concerned now have a right to standing before, court, before the court. We see it in Latin America, we've seen it in Europe as well. That's a new development. I, it's very interesting and, and of course to many states very scary, but, uh, but, but it, there is a, I think it's a positive sign uh, in, in fact. Um, I, um, I also want to make, um, I also want to make uh, two more comments, one on something that that you said, Daniel, on the ILC, you said that, well, the ILC had, had, was quoted as having had the heavy lawmaking behind it. I don't, I don't agree on that. I mean, there are the, numer the numerous conventions that the ILC um, have negotiated or produced in, in recent years have been really crucial conventions. So we, we now see the crimes against humanity. We have a proposal on the protection of their persons in the event of disaster. It's an excellent uh, convention that needs to be transformed in a multilateral process to a, a multilateral treaty. It's just because the way of thinking, in a sense, is so narrow that if you don't rephrase or renegotiate the law of treaties or the law of the uh, diplomatic protection or whatever, then then it's, it's as if it's not nothing worth. But we are building on the work that was done in the 50s and the 60s and, and, and the early 70s to the next phase of the in, needs for the international community, an international community that has so triple as much many states as it had when the ILC started and when the ILC was only, uh, 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 was not as many, uh, didn't have as many, um, uh, members as, as the ILC have today. So, um, and I, I don't claim to say, Daniel, that you said this. I, I just know that the, 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 um, this is the view that is often put forward, or, well, not often, but sometimes put forward, and I, I simply fail to, to, um, to, um, to agree with it. Um, so, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Ambassador Jacob. Certainly, that, that certainly is not my view. Um, quite the opposite. Um, not that I'm declaiming it, but I want to link those things you you highlighted, and I'm going to bring uh, Deary and you. You highlighted Ambassador Jacob with something, separating that Ambassador Kanu said about this equity versus equal opportunity. And I also see a distinction between voice and outcome, which is you know a lot of what we're focusing on. Even my questions so far have been and discussion, which is to say. Is there equal voice in terms of representation, both of the states, and then also want to talk about the expert bodies, you know, both Professor Kaladi and you, Ambassador uh, Jackson, you know, we can talk about the representation and, and you, Professor Desieto, who is on these expert bodies is obviously a, a lot more uh, delegation to expert bodies first before going back to the states. So uh, on the one hand, and I would say, is this, I mean, these are all important. This is perhaps in line even more, as, as Professor Claddy said, where we are globally, I'm not saying successfully, but appropriate focus on um, representation and voice. And I challenge, I'll go to Professor Claddy and say, you know, you, you mentioned, and Ian rightfully so, I mean, the other way, you know, I have to be honest, in a, a bad way, not honest, as recognizing, and I've heard you speak about the, you know, special rapporteur, lack of representation for a number of years. I'm not sure, I, mean, I think it may have, hasn't got massively better otherwise, but even beyond that, not that these things aren't important, far from it, the opposite, but if we are focused, say, on equity in terms of what is the content, beyond even the formal treaty making, as Ambassador Jacobson said, but even in, say, in terms of how do we interpret you know, development, and that brings in the courts aspect, as Sieto said, in terms of development of international law accordingly, is a, a focus that is a part of what we're talking about. It's not, is it a fig leaf? But even we talk and say, like, this focus on the ILC, it's not necessarily clear that an increase in either gender representation or special rapporteurs from I mean, the other often statistics they talk about, seeing with the ICJ, you know, everyone, all the judges, they've all studied in one of, you know, it used to be four universities, now I think it's five, you know, that kind of a sort of background, part of that same community. Uh, how, you know, there's not necessarily attention, but is focus on representation and in some ways, perhaps the equal opportunity aspects, I'm not putting ideas into the mouth of, of uh, Ambassador Kanu, does that get in the way of, really focusing on which is you know are the laws being produced either formally or even as ambassador jackson would say the interpretation of is is the content of the development unrepresentative inequitable continually to be so i mean i know there's an easy answer to say no it's important of course it is but is the focus of our energies in that way and i'll follow anyway professor Colombi. um thank you very much before answering your, your specific question, and I'll answer it very quickly, um, I, I do want to just go back a couple of steps to the broader conversation that you that that the um, um, the panel had before you posed this this slightly different question to me, um, and that is about the slowdown in treaty making. And I only go back because I I I have a definitively different position. I think from um, what has been expressed. And so I think I, I, I think it would be useful to express it. Um, so I come to this panel really from an anecdotal perspective, purely. Uh, I've done absolutely no research. I'm in preparation for this. It's just purely anecdote because I thought that's what you were, you were looking for. Um, so, so one point I will make is, is, is I'm not even sure that the premise of the question is correct. So I'm not sure that there is a slowdown in treaty making. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure how many of us on the panel have actually done a count to see. One thing I will say is that to actually make that point would also require that you, you identify the particular periods that you are comparing. Um, so are you comparing the last 10 years with the 10 years before that? Are you comparing the last five years with the five years before that? Are you comparing the last 20 years with the 20? I mean, depending on sort of how you, you configure that, um, the answer might be different. But also if you're really thinking about treaty making, um, so very often we think about the big treaties, right? So the UN treaties, uh, so Michael spoke about BB&J and so on, so on, so on. But there are you know, uh, regional treaties that are being concluded almost all the time. Uh, so, so, so one, I'm not sure that there is a slowdown. Um, but two, if there is a slowdown, um, I don't think it's a problem. Um, and it's, I, uh, and the reason I don't think it's a problem is also 
a different reason from um, uh, the reason um, that was given by um, Marie uh, and also the reason that was given by Diane. I, I, I think the reason why it's not a problem is that, um, again, anecdotally, my experience with treaty making um, is developing countries going, um, right, and I'm sorry I'm using this loose, uh, um, loose categorization. I was told it's not, um, it's not, it's not, it's not accurate. It's not, it's not clearly reflective of what's going on. Um, so, but again, from my anecdotal perspective, it is a, an extremely important um, distinction. This um, sort of um, 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 developed country, developing country um, distinction. My anecdotal experience is developing countries go into these treaty processes gung ho, excited about a new treaty. Uh, when you you, you finally get to the outcome of the treaty, um, it looks very different to what they wanted at the beginning. Uh, Michael is leading uh, right now the group of African states um, on BB&J. Um, I worked on that process from the very beginning, so 2005, 2006, I started working on that process and I followed it to today. When that process began, what was the issue, Michael? The issue when that process began was about the common heritage of mankind. That, that's not on the table anymore, right? Something else is being negotiated. Um, I was involved, in fact, my, my very first big treaty that came to fruition uh, was the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur um, uh, Supplementary Protocol um, to the Nagoya Protocol on um, um, so the GMO, right? Uh, the the outcome was a complete different one than what the people, the, the group of states that actually wanted the treaty wanted. Um, um, so I hesitate a little bit about um, sort of this demand for more treaty making as if the demand for more treaty making will address the issues. Because again, because of the structural issues that a lot of us know, right? So expertise. Um, I, I have three questions in the chat box. I don't know if I'm going to have a chance to answer them, but I guess I, I have an opportunity now to answer one of them. Um, uh, so because of the, the structural issues that all of us are aware, um, very often uh, developing countries aren't able to quite participate on the very same level as their counterparts. Um, and so the result is that the treaty, you know, even though it was pushed by a particular group of states, looks very different from what those group of states um, so would have wanted. So at least from that perspective, I mean, I'm not sure that it's, um, um, it's, um, it's a, a necessarily a bad thing if there is a slowdown. And by the way, I'm not sure that there is a slowdown. Um, I note that Marie, in your, your, your response and sort of referring to the number of, of, of possible treaties um, um, that, that, that have been developed by the ILC in recent times that haven't been taken up, um, you didn't mention the articles on state responsibility, which a lot of developing countries want. Um, it's simply not going to happen. Um, um, you didn't mention uh, the draft articles on expulsion of aliens, uh, which received uh, warm reception from a particular group of states, developing countries, but received a rather cool reception from developed states. So these are kinds of issues that I think we ought to think about. Um, to answer your question, I think it's actually, um, the more specific question, I think it's actually imperative to have representation. I think representation is important. Um, so Michael mentioned a book that has just come out um, uh, to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the ILC, um, and those of you who are part of it will remember that the format was two members from academ um, academia speak, and then at the end, a member of the International Law Commission uh, responds. Um, and I actually was on a panel, so I had to respond to two papers by academics that that, that focused on um, gender representation. Um, and one of the, um, so the academics said, um, it actually doesn't matter. Right, the outcome will be dip, um, so the same regardless of whether or not there's um, gender representation or not. I, I think that's false. In fact, I think that's false, and you can see it in the work of the current composition of the commission. So, if you take, for example, um, th there is no way. Um, I put it categorically: there is no way the draft Article Seven on uh, immunities would have been adopted had we had the same composition of the commission last year. 
the current composition of the commission has more women. Uh, there is no way that draft article two of the topic um, that I'm leading, uh, use Kogans would have been adopted uh, with that composition. And I think that the decisive role that's played, now I'm not saying that it's because they're women, but the decisive role that's played was played by the women on the commission. It's not because of the agenda, but those women, those particular women played an, a particularly important. So, so, so I wouldn't push it aside. One last point. Um, so on the special rapporteurs, we, we all come from um, different traditions. When you have a special rapporteur who comes from a particular tradition, they push a particular line and that is the focus of the commission. That is the starting point of the commission. And of course that's going to influence the outcome. Um, if a particular member of um, the ILC was special rapporteur for uh, use Corgans, um, you would never have had a proposal for what is now draft article two that speaks about uh, um, uh, the values of the right. You wouldn't have had that. Uh, you wouldn't have had that. And that wouldn't be in. So, of course, it's important who the special rapporteurs are. Um, um, it influences the outcome. So in that sense, representation and outcome um, are absolutely interlinked. Um, so again, I hope I'll have an opportunity to answer these, these questions in the chat box. If not, I'll just type the answers um, as you wish if we're running out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Again, I'm just asking questions and, and ignore those. As, you know, this is, I'm just the mere medium, not in a let's see ghost way, but in a get you guys talking. Um, I will clear out one thing I feel just from the, the chat box the, the, the posted, Professor Taladi. I, I don't think you were saying at the beginning in terms of the responsibility being on developing states was about the states, but was about on the commission and the members themselves, but I still push you potentially on that. Now, linking all these things and I certainly wasn't fighting is uh, let, let's focus a little bit on those expert bodies that we're going you know, back to the future. We'll go back to state representatives at the end, uh, given comments from, from all of you to ignore. And one question that I, I think about and bringing things that you all have said, is one thing is about language. One thing is about you know, where those bodies, and I, I will include the ICJ or other courts to the extent that they're you know, developing, and that, that's what we're talking about. I you know, certainly focusing on or launching off on the formal treating process was just as a starter point. I think as, as all of you answered and as even Ambassador Jackson made sort of clear, even when expert bodies aren't even working on uh, products that are meant to be treaties, but they're making international law. So we're certainly here talking about the creating and shaping of development of international law in that way is beyond formal treaty making. So we'll leave that empirical debate and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to another session with the data uh, accordingly. To say, let's focus one example is, is uh, bringing in this question of, of, of challenging and resources, which is says, how could and should silence be interpreted? And this is something I know that in different products, both in the reservations, work on treaties, and then on customs national law project, that although we're not focusing on the ILC just because the members here are my own sort of background to see like anybody, I'm sure, you know, I know that Ambassador Kanu, Professor so and your other uh, work. Uh, has to be looking at what does silence mean and how to interpret that. And we're talking about some of the reasons for, but putting the emphasis back onto the experts, quote unquote, when you're interpreting and shaping those bodies, there doesn't seem to have been, well, perhaps I'm being sort of unfair, there's certainly a mention, and obviously there are these you know, ideas of how do you interpret silence, whether it's on reservations or on creating of international law, while there's obviously acknowledgement. I mean, these kind of panels, there isn't a panel at like a, an American style international law or something. When you pose a question to an ICJ judge or an ILC member, they say, we really want more comments. We want more participation from developing states. But that hasn't led, however, is any pausing of the progress of those topics and perhaps even if looking at the products you say the comments and reservations or otherwise so linking not only what does silence mean these linguistic barriers uh, in the sense of english and french both at the court or even within the six quote-unquote languages of the united nations how that sort of works what are practical ways you may suggest i'm going to actually start here for, uh, as with ambassador jackson to say with multiple hats on uh, either when your ilc role or others acknowledging that there are 
resource constraints and capacity constraints, and we'll get to some perhaps solutions for that from a number of straits. I mean, I, I, I obviously Deary painted a, a picture of Swedish perfection. I often say, you know, you know, Sweden is sort of the model, um, fairly or otherwise. But to be not everyone Sweden is my sort of line, but to be that is in that same opportunity. How does that build? Is that maybe even a positive thing from your national legal advising hat in knowing that perhaps the law will be shaped? I'm sure you won't officially agree with that, but how to interpret silence and how in practical ways, you know, I know when I was at the, the UN, the idea that you would be you know, ideally, of course, you'd be able to look at Burmese legislation in Burmese and that perhaps is un unrealistic. So uh, how do you interpret silence given that it's partly capacity constraints, partly people don't care, the, you know, question again, it's not me saying this as possible answers. And then equally the linguistic constraints knowing, I mean, you know, many parts of the world are not Anglophone or, or Francophone or, you know, even within each of those, the LC works often in sort of one and the other more than others. Um, I'll start with Ambassador Jacobson and, and to everybody. Thank you very much, Daniel. Let me just make one thing clear, I think, so that I wasn't misunderstood. When I talked about that I was less concerned about this slowing down a multilateral treaty process or making, I was talking about multilateral. And uh, Dira, you're very right. I, 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 I don't have, I haven't researched it, but I would definitely agree with you that there is no slowing down in other areas, in regional um, treaties or in bilateral treaties. Um, that, so, so, but I thought I understood that the question was, and that what we discussed was the multilateral treaty making. That's why I wanted to contrast it with those who withdraw from the treaty makers. Now, the, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, I didn't uh, mention state responsibility or expulsion of aliens, uh, but I agree with you wholeheartedly, of course, uh, that, that's, uh, that's very good examples. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, so Daniel, again, thank you for, for the question, which brings me back to a question that you posed to me earlier, which I have failed to answer, namely, basically, how do you involve uh, incorporate the views of other in your in your domestic process before you represent make your presentation at the multilateral. I mean, we have we have we try to do that, uh, and that goes back very very uh, long time. So when when we are discussing or when we are negotiating, for example, BB and J, or when we are uh, or when we did the ICC and so forth, there are consultations with. Uh, not only with other departments and, and authorities, but also, of course, NGOs, uh, including human rights NGOs or environmental NGOs. So we 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 become quite used to to do that, um, and so that's been a tradition. And that is also true, actually, for the, the comments that the Nordic countries make in the context of the ILC uh, debate, namely that we we don't make interventions individually, but we go, we get together and have a set up a tradition to work together and present the Nordic views, that is five countries. And I know that for sure that even if we are developed countries, none of the Nordic countries would have been able to comment on all of these issues um, in a more sort of structured or profound way. We would have had to pick one or two that was the most concern to us. But the fact that we have a long tradition and I would recommend to cooperate, and I would really recommend other states to do the same. Uh, you don't have to be in agreement of everything, but it really helps a lot. And you, you once you have established a structure, it's easy to build on. Now, the, the question of silence, thank you for that really, really interesting question. Uh, I, when I was in the ILC, I was, I voiced my, uh, I raised my voice several times on the issue of silence because I think one should be very, very, very careful as a lawyer to interpret silence as consent. I think that would be the most um, dangerous things to thing to do. Not only is it not correct, uh, but it's also a question that uh, really uh, aims at saying that since you haven't raised your voice, you have you've sort of consumed your rights to have an opinion on this or that. I think that is 
that is something that we that is not acceptable ne neither from the point of law nor from the point of, of policy the uh, uh, the the question of how you include those countries or those areas where you cannot read the language, for example, in my case, Chinese or Russia, I mean, in most, most languages of the world, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but when I was a special rapporteur, you have to reach out. You have to go, you have to ask someone from China, could you check this? Could you check the languages? Is there anything in the China? I, I asked uh, students or, or, or PhD students to say, could you check the Chinese uh, legislation on that and that area? Or, I could you check the Russian legislation and that and that. I built up structures with 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 uh, small nation states in 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 the UN who were present there and who had representation. And I also, in fact, I also visited some of these regions, and it it was extremely valuable for me. I wouldn't have been able to do my research or my report if I hadn't had if I hadn't had if I hadn't reached out. It's a lot of work, of course. And don't say I could do this because I'm from a developed countries and I have all the resources. No, that's not true. I was working at the ministry. I don't. I did not have the resources. I didn't have uh, interns that I could employ from university and so on and so forth. But so I accepted those who worked for me pro bono, and that was very very good. But you had to make your structure. So it takes effort, but it it can work. This is my point. Thank you. You're muted, Daniel. I have, uh, I have, I have learned that lesson. That was just uh, an example of what not to do. Um, thank you, Professor Jackson. I was saying, uh, I'm going to pose the same but slightly adjusted question to, uh, to you, Professor Desieto. Linking, you know, you talked about these structural, even ideological, quite, you know, Correct as as I see it, of course we're open to challenge. I don't think this is the group to to challenge this today. But then connecting that to then these sort of practical. So you know you've had not only I know in this this working group on the rights of development, but uh, correct wrong your work on the arbitration. This is you know and human rights rules. So conceptualizing similar challenges in terms of language or silence and this capacity uh, differential from a how do you interpret this point of view? So we're gonna, we're gonna get next to uh, preparing uh, Ambassador Kanu to be from the state representative side, like what kind of challenges and what kind of assistance and change transformation could happen, but from then receiving what you receive perspective from that, you know, as you're sitting there on the working group, the right development, you may, and I'm not saying this is true, but just say like hypothetically, you know, you receive a vast number of, inclusions of states from, from either the global north or developed states are much less uh, either in terms of you know quantity or even then engaging with the topic what role do you uh, do you have as not you put not just you personally but that kind of extra body to sort of take that in consideration similarly with the question of silence of recognizing or is that sort of I wouldn't call it judicial lawmaking of course but again that sort of, you know, codification, progressive development kind of challenge uh, your, your face in that kind of body. So how do you take, let's say, the, the, the not just theoretical, the ideological and, and policy and political realities that you set out, but then you're trying to be practical and you're trying to move the making of international law forward in a way that isn't just, that there is an answer to say, like perhaps pose that to say, until you get such inputs, let us stall this process. Otherwise, it's going to be artificially continuing the sort of imbalances that you that you talked about and uh, and all our panelists talked about. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you to Ambassador Jacobson and, and to Diri as well for, for their views before this. Let me first clarify, participation has many gradations. And as Ambassador Jacobson rightly pointed out, in the environmental space, we have seen more progress in this respect. I can point to the conclusion of the Escasu Agreement and the Aarhus Agreements, which are both, uh, which provide for a systemic approach to how to do sequenced participation, depending on the nature of the question that is put forward. Right. So what I what I would extrapolate this from is uh, 
there are systems and there are structures for determining participation, even in my own work assisting the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is a very um, hybrid organization where you have an extremely developed state, Singapore and Bahrain, uh, sorry, Brunei, for example, and then those who are least developed states who are part of the CMLV countries um, within the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And there you cannot say that silence is performative. You cannot, the sheer linguistic diversity implies a necessity, a deliberate pause that is required on the part of the member states to ensure that there is consensus and that's provided for within the charter of the organization. Treaties are concluded by consensus. And so because there is a formal institutional mechanism that provides for some space within which to consult, within which to try and ascertain and elicit what the views are from the very diverse members of the organization, that is a space for um, a different kind of lawmaking. Some might say ASEAN is on a treaty making explosion. It's been there for the last 50 years. And in fact, the growth of its regional agreements, not just on trade, but also in environmental matters and aviation and economic cooperation matters is something that's quite rapid, um, probably more rapid than some parts of the world um, in this respect. So how would I, how would I see silence? I, I, I would not treat it, or, or neither would I treat participation in, in its broad sense with any sense of uniformity. I, again, I will call back to, let's think about what the participation is for. What's the end goal? When we say we want to bring in consultations with groups that are affected by rules, does it mean that they automatically will write the rules themselves? Or do we permit them to give views, give them due notice and participation the way the European Union does, for example? Um, do we permit sequenced consultations? Now, unfortunately, in the what I've found from the differences in my experience in the regional organization of ASEAN, as opposed to working with the UN, um, open-ended working group on the right to development is that where we have so many rules within ASEAN for that kind of sequenced participation, we have about 1800 meetings a year across all the work of the regional organization that does have its resource challenges. In the working group, in the drafting of the draft treaty on the right to convention, it was largely driven by the chair rapporteur who selected experts, who invited experts, who did sequenced resource consultations with different stakeholders in Geneva. But even now, when we are in the process of going and communicating with the individual member states and trying to elicit the views, not just of the member states, but of international and local civil society, the socialization aspect is also dependent on resources. And the UN has manifold priorities with which it can invest promotion, with which it can invest um, structures with the necessary resources to enable consultation and participation. So if we're going to think about that, I mean, I would invite thinking about, I, I, I was struck by what Ambassador Jacobson said about <laughs> not always having the resources um, to do the kinds of research. I feel that most of the time when we're doing ASEAN research where it is an extremely uh, heterogeneous system of uh, different languages, thousands of different languages, different systems and different legal systems and not all of them translated or even harmonized. So it's a continuing work in progress but we have to be thoughtful and really quite intentional about how we design participation who we're excluding and be transparent about the information that we produce in the process of lawmaking. That I think is something concrete and practical that could be done. Thank you, Professor uh, Desieto. Yes, I mean, uh, referring back to my previous comment, if, if even Sweden has resource constraints, um, what can we? Um, but uh, turning, I don't know, put Sweden on a pedestal today. I apologize for Australia, I know they're, I would say Sweden, not even Sweden, Sweden, but uh, Ambassador Kanu, uh, linking from that, um, acknowledging that, that, you know, that, perhaps leaping over the comments that Professor Dissio said that we'll come back and I think end on which to say that uh, 
the resource constraints go beyond individual states, beyond you know the processes themselves, linking that to our initial conversation, maybe not only is it not a problem about formal treaty lawmaking, there's it's too much. That's another comment also, I know that the Professor Claddy and Ambassador Trickson heard with their ILC hats on that we're going from certain states too far, too fast. That's just a case study. There's too much. No one can really, you know, speak up. And this is not from a let's retreat from the global rule of law perspective, so not from me, but being somewhat concrete, potentially, uh, Ambassador Kanu, you, you're, you're head of the delegation or, you know, formally or act as if for the sake of it. I'm not in any way, you know, the niceties of your even delightfully not taking credit for being the African group legal advisor would say this, but in the theoretical position that perhaps even for African states or even just small developing states, what are, do you see it some of the best ways to enhance this capability? So acknowledging that although Professor Laddie at the beginning was talking about um, some of the constraints only in terms of the fault being in terms of the members, but beyond that was also identifying, as, as you said, the real challenges the small developing states have to participate in, in all ways, you know, formal treaty making and formal ensuring that their practice internally is out there. I know, you know, I had historical discussions, for example, with the legal officers of the African Union concerning, you know, looking at the State Department or the, the Foreign Office, every annual production of everything anyone has ever said that potentially could shape international law so that expert bodies or just other states are be able to refer to it. Is it a linguistic thing? I mean, you, you see some tinkering, I think it was a couple of weeks ago now, this at least General Assembly resolution, for example, to fund the uh, um, clerkships at the ICJ for uh, participants from small developing states, you know, uh, something that both Professor De Sierto and I were, uh, did, but, you know, coming from developed country universities, but uh, th that's important, but it, it seems like a bit of a, you know, icing on a, a big wider cake. So uh, empowered as I have just given you in this world to be in charge of determining the lawmaking capacity needs of all small developing states, what do you need? What do you want? What's going to have the biggest impact over to you? Thank you, Daniel. Um, hopefully, I'm able to get the question, uh, but it, it really touches on, on several issues. Um, if you could permit me, just cycling back to what has been said, linking the equity to your question in terms of resources and what is needed, um, and also just um, touching a bit on, on the issue of, of silence and how do we interpret that, not in the formal legal sense of, um, as I agree with the panel, not acceptance, but really what it means in the practical sense of negotiations and, and how do you address decision making in terms of legitimacy. Now, when, when I made reference to equity, it was in the sense of the test of the resolve of um, state parties in terms of interest in the issue, but also consistency in term, uh, when it comes to who attends to the issue, the resources available, the experts, and of course, dealing with all the logistical issues. Uh, when you say you, we, you are equal opportunity, it means you, I mean, access may be there, especially for states, not necessarily for non-state actors, but we increasingly see involvement of non-state actors. But how do you take advantage of that um, access? And, and that's where the equity comes in. I'll give an example. When I picked up the um, on trial report in the annual session, um, there's a paragraph which really tells you about um, those that would attend the on trial assembly and, of course, the decision making that will follow. And uh, the recommendation that will come to uh, that will come about the instruments um, that um, uh, states will eventually adopt and ratify the Singapore Mediation Convention could be one example, for example, uh, one example to cite uh, with, I think, up to 60 states on, on, on the first and uh, the signing itself. That's a good number. The, the question is, when you look at the work of the uh, working group um, that got uh, states towards um, the adoption of that convention, would you say that um, there was um, equal voice and participation throughout the process that led to such an um, outcome in which you say there's legitimacy because it went through and a lot of states have adopted, uh, ratified the convention? Um, and, and you juxtapose that with um, um, the current negotiations on um, investor state dispute settlement, which is very important to all, uh, 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 especially developing state parties. 
and you look at um, who are engaged in the process and the issues that have been discussed, one of the things which um, you have in the fall is uh, do we need a multilateral investment court. This gets into language and I will add location. So uh, the a whole um, um, a sort of um, international uh, a, a set of states that are pushing for um, the multilateral investment court with the idea that it will be a court that will be based in a specific location. And you see that um, it will fit, fit in into the resources that are available in that location in terms of um, expertise in international law, resources, and, um, and um, the experience of a particular uh, host nation in terms of hosting um, international legal institution. So what happens is that um, if you're not in that location, and of course, um, dealing with the language problem, you, you tend to be, and I don't like to use this, but the initial um, an image we have of international relations, the center and the periphery. So if there's going to be a multilateral investment court, which let's say it's going to be based in where the other international and legal institutions are based, then you have a center in which um, the continued work, expertise, the problems of diversity you have in investment disputes will continue. How do you address this imbalance is also dealing with them. Um, how do you um, attend to having the structure of this multilateral investment court that, that you ensure that it's not based within a specific uh, um, region, but of course it has uh, a structure in which would benefit both developing and developing uh, capital importing and capital exporting states. So when you notice that imbalance, uh, I, I know a lot is placed on um, the uh, negotiators and, and, and the representatives of um, developing states. You tend to find uh, means within the system to rectify that. One of the means that was used recently in the sixth committee was to ensure that um, in the resolution on UNCITRAL, um, there was an extension, there was a proposal that came from um, um, African state parties for the extension of um, the trust fund for attendance and participation. So participation is still key um, um, in those engagement and meetings so that you ensure the views to deal with um, the structural problems that exist will be addressed. Now, um, recently in the General Assembly, the discussion on um, clerkship and the International Court of Justice and how do you um, address the imbalance in terms of um, uh, the um, universities that have enough resources to send the students to benefit from opportunities in terms of who services um, the international law uh, system, including the international lawmaking process. Um, it's a question of resources, but um, there has to be a, a specific outlook towards ensuring equity, so dealing with the imbalance, um, ensuring that um, um, there are further opportunities for others to participate, not necessarily um, those um, within the specific location in the center, if you may, but um, it is open to all. Um, Having those trust funds, uh, as I've mentioned, the fund does not necessarily mean that you deal with all the, the imbalances and the, and the problem that exists. Uh, we're dealing with BBNJ and um, we have a trust fund, but um, basically it's an empty trust fund. A trust fund that has to be replenished every now and then to have experts to attend. Um, and uh, let me just finish my intervention. Probably have gone around circles to come to a point which DA raised in 2005 when you were dealing with the BBNJ. The contention and issue was um, the common heritage of mankind. But through the preparatory meeting, organizational matters, and the package was agreed. Uh, the conversation is now about um, a question, including a part of common heritage of mankind, question of benefit sharing, and, and some of um, aspects which um, may seem to have deviated from the initial conversation. Um, if there is no system of uh, group representation, there's no system of uh, specific focus from uh, a certain point of view, um, the tests on resources, the tests on resilience, the tests in terms of the result to follow through on the issue will lead to a complete failure because of um, as you would say, um, equal opportunity does not mean that um, you have equal resources to deal with those questions. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, um, international lawmaking and the legitimacy of international lawmaking um, is linked to really um, the, the, the political imbalance and um, it takes much more than just resources to, to get to um, the place of equity. Thank you.
another uplifting statement. Um, thank you, Ambassador Kanu. No, no, uh, uh, um, I'm conscious of the time. Um, I want to give uh, each of the panelists after that sort of uh, 50,000 feet perspective response from uh, Ambassador Kanu, sort of a last perhaps minute, uh, 90 seconds to say, look, you know, we'll come back in 10 years. You know, Knock on wood. I mean, being here in ten years, I don't mean coming back here in ten years, but something to necessarily look forward to. Um, same topic. Uh, I know many of you have already spoken this. You know, what are the best ways or quicker ways to transform so that some of these challenges, as as Shantali said at the beginning, yes, it's been obvious, brought up all the time, or not brought up to a certain degree because it's so obvious that we're sitting here, we're seeing significant change in this sort of. Uh, at least a way of assessing the state of the of the making of international law, and perhaps I'll go in reverse order of initial speaking. So, uh, you know, magical bullets again with that same as a perspective. You now, Professor Sieto, in charge of, uh, uh, of lawmaking for all of the, the uh, you know the world to a certain degree. What is ultimately going to lead to a, 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 this is a ridiculous question in some ways? Sitting here in ten years' time and and it's in its most changed perspective from where we are now. That's a decision in a minute, nine seconds. Thank you, Daniel. I mean, if we think about what's going to happen 10 years from now, that's something I worry about considering we are in the middle of a climate crisis and we are in the middle of a global health crisis as we speak. So if we talk about the global multinational transnational challenges, they are manifold and if anything, the demand for concerted legitimate, accepted international lawmaking is stronger now, I would say, than in the post-war era at the dawn of the United Nations. If anything, because the reality of cross-border regulation directly impacts lives in a scale that's unprecedented today with the environmental health and the development challenges that we face collectively as a, as a world, as one humanity, the challenge is to ensure that there is responsibility in the representation, but there's also thoughtful, intentional attention that's paid to those who are most directly impacted, those who are most vulnerable. We talk about leaving no one behind in the policies of the United Nations. I find it ironic because when it talks about leaving no one behind and internalizing human rights truly across the responses, the multilateral responses to this pandemic, there is still a massive deficit when it comes to information, when it comes to transparency, when it comes to even the very same opportunities we've been discussing to participate in the policymaking process, not necessarily at every stage of the process, but to have a sequence, thoughtful, functional, and targeted manner in order to ensure true accountability for human rights at a time wow. like this, when it is cross-border by impact especially when it comes to any other type of international lawmaking, whether it's in the spheres of economics, whether it's in the spheres of global health or the spheres of global security, it has never been more urgent. So if I think about what we should be doing now, I wonder why it took the International Court of Justice about the 12 years since I was there before they decided they were going to democratize the number of, of clerks and you know the identity of clerks that they would take. That's a small example, but there has to be a concerted effort by all organizations to rethink, maybe from a social sciences perspective, how their practices institutionally or otherwise are reifying challenges to intersectionality, whether it's at the level of the ILC, the distinguished ILC that whose work I very much appreciate, or the works of regional organizations. How do we reproduce the same challenges to diversity, the same challenges of exclusion that rise from the same issues of conceptual, structural, and ideological issues that I've described? And until we're willing to make that intentional rather than just a byproduct of some of the things we want to do. I worry about how we're going to deal with global challenges. There are more and more that are being left behind and it can't just be a slogan anymore. I'll just move the on Ambassador Jackson. 
So um, I, I'll try to be a little bit more optimistic uh, in the sense that I, I do believe in the progress of small states uh, steps, even if even if it's uh, uh, if even if we have really huge global challenges to address. Uh, I've been a lawyer for quite a few quite some time. And I've seen a development that have gone far beyond what, what was even conceivable when I started to work in international law, when human rights was considered as purely an internal domestic matter to something today that is so clear and not only a right to discuss, uh, and, but also an obligation to, to discuss. I believe very much uh, if, if you look at what happened in, the, in, in my first five years of the ILC, what kind of participation we had and what kind of exchanges of views with non-governmental organizations, very re restrictive. Today, they work in a totally different way, uh, and which I very much welcome. I also welcome the small steps that courts are taking, domestic courts and, and regional courts, to include um, representation before the court, uh, and I think that these kind of small steps we shouldn't we shouldn't disregard them. I, I think they are valuable, and all very much. I think this relates to the fact that we have a new generation, a new generation coming up that looks upon these things in a different manner. It won't solve the problem, but it will certainly make sure that some of the deficiencies and mistakes that was made before in exclusion and non-participation is simply not acceptable any longer. Well, it may be rhetorics, but rhetorics is forced to go into practical examples and practical participation. So, um, so I'll be I'll be more optimistic, even if I, of course, realize and agree that we are we have really global challenges to meet, but. Um, but I do think that we will be up to it to some extent. The alternative would be simply not acceptable. That would be leave it as it is. And that is not something that we can do. We can all do something. Thank you. I muted myself again. Um, Professor Tlavi, final. Yeah, so um, I'll just be really brief. Um, I mean, I agree with what um, um, has been said. Um, the one point, um, just to sort of as one uh, final point, is this pooling of resources as a, a solution. I think it's 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 been mentioned a couple of times. Um, it certainly has had an impact on contribution and therefore, to a certain extent, um, a representation. Uh, but I do not think that it is the answer to the question. We've had this conversation. I've had this conversation with Michael. Um, I think the effect of pooling resources is, in fact, to dilute the voices of um, those who are already underrepresented. So while um, it's certainly a... Um, um, something to think about in the interim. I, I don't see that as a um, um, as a solution. But and to maybe uh, uh, be a little more pessimistic than Marie, I, I always am actually. Um, I think the problems are, as Michael said, are much deeper than that. Um, and I'll, to to give you a sense of this, I'll give you an anecdote. Um, and I won't explain what the anecdote means to me. It should be self-evident. I'll just give the anecdote and leave it at that. Um, in 2012, one of the legal advisors of one of the permanent members of the Security Council was departing New York, um, and they had a dinner. And uh, present at the dinner was the five legal advisors of um, the state from, from which this um, um, legal advisor came from. Um, the permanent representative of the state, uh, myself, I don't know how I managed to get the invite, but I managed to get an invite, um, and the legal counselor of the United Nations. 
Um, and at some point, as they were having a conversation, they almost forgot that I was there in the room. Um, and, and one representative said to her, do you remember the time when you had drafted the piracy report? This is the Secretary General's report on which UN General Assembly resolutions are based. Um, and, and apparently, this was negotiated first between uh, the one legal advisor of one state, one big state, and this other legal advisor. And the that's the depth of the problem that we're facing. It's not just about resources. It's also about access. It's also about power play behind all manner of things that we don't see. And I'm going to leave it at that as a, um, a thought. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tladi. So uh, problem solved. Um, I guess um, I'm very conscious of the time. Let me thank in no particular order first my co-organizers from, from UCLA, the, the Twal group from the International Practice Group of Gibson Dunn uh, and from, from Independent International Legal Advocates and my colleagues. Most of all, uh, thank you, well not most of all, thank you all for coming, for listening. We will be uh, in fourth way of posting only the video of this and then in, in, in turn the, the podcast and spreading it wide. Uh, we're very, you know, the new generation, they like to listen to things. Uh, the, the, the check as we talked about. Um, uh, of course, let me thank also our co-sponsor for, for this and future sessions at the National University of Singapore Center for International Law. Uh, I don't, I hope no one from there is, is awake at this time, but we will be, that's the whole point of the video and podcasting that all around the world uh, can listen and engage. Um, session uh, three, uh, of our series, uh, soon to be advertised, uh, will be taking place uh, in, in mid-February. Details to follow from all the same uh, sources that you heard about this one. That one will be going back to the past, so to speak. My butchered 1980s film references failing me, uh, focusing on accountability and responsibility for historical wrongs. How international law does or does not deal with them, obviously, not only uh, issues of colonization and beyond. And now I can say most of all, let me thank the four speakers for, you know, I probably got lost in time, it was so engaging um, and for their time zones, I think that optimistically or pessimism, I always say, you know, I started off with it and I'll end with it, you know, pessimism of the, of the intellect, optimism of the will, um, I certainly wouldn't be here if those challenges cannot be faced and changed, you know, start sound like the West Wing in the sense of, uh, you know, the only thing that's ever changed anything is groups of human beings. So. Um, thank you all. Thank you, the panelists. Thank you all. Have a, a good rest of January and a, a good rest of 2021. Uh, goodbye for now. <laughs>